Oh, howdy all. Grab yourselves a beer. It is time for some Path of Exile discussion. Today, I wanted to talk about my opinions on the Harvest League, uh, Harvest crafting mechanics, and what, if anything, I think should go core as the game uh, goes on. I will give a fair heads up that this is going to be a fairly long video uh, because there was just so much that I wanted to squish into it. If you want to read the notes that I've made that are on the screen at the moment, they're on my blog at sergog.com. So, Harvest has had a very love it or hate it response. Uh, the most vocal voices on Reddit, who may or may not represent a majority of players, it's really impossible to tell, have called the Grove mechanics boring and uninspired, but have said that they generally tend to say that the crafting methods are one of the best changes to the game ever. As I see it, there's a number of common opinions that people have, and that these correlate to various types of players. Uh, I'm going to try and put each of these opinions as fairly as I can uh, before really pro going into my own thoughts. Uh, but the TLDW version is going to be that what I think should happen with Harvest Crafting is that it should go core in some form for non-influenced items, uh, but it should be massively, massively nerfed in its ability to be used on influenced items. So the first thing I want to say is that I want to define a couple of categories of players uh, that and you know, just some terminology that I'm going to use. So I'm going to refer to casual players, enfranchised players, and power gamers a bit through this video. Uh, casual players, generally speaking, is anyone that sees killing the uh, Izaro in the Eternal Labyrinth as a big deal. Uh, so I'm not talking about this as a judgment on their level of skill at gaming in general. Uh, I don't think that these people are unskilled or stupid or anything like that. Uh, and I you know, really don't like the way that the term casual player is often used as a, type of, as a term of abuse. This is people that have chosen not to dedicate a large amount of time to Path of Exile for whatever reason. Uh, plenty of valid reasons for that. Maybe they've got a busy life. Maybe they play lots of games. Uh, maybe they just find the game more fun when they're only playing it at, at that level of engagement. Uh, many of these players are capable of becoming even power gamers if they want to, but their decision not to, not to do so is entirely valid. Uh, now, so yeah, I'm thinking of people that, broadly speaking, would, set, would see something like uh, killing Izaro in the Eternal Labyrinth as a major goal for, for their entire league. These players make up a majority of the player base, but because of their lower playtime, I expect they actually make up a minority of hours played. I expect that the majority of hours played are by the next category, the enfranchised players. Uh, I am not including, in the term casual player, the sort of person that tries the game, spends an hour or two on it, and then decides, you know what, this just is not for me. So uh, looking at Steam achievement statistics, you can see that only 33.6% of players ever complete Act 2. However, of the people that complete Act 6, so uh, there is a Steam achievement for slaying one of the gods and see, uh, for killing one of the gods. So you can't beat Act 6 without killing the Brine King, uh, which means, sorry if that was a spoiler for anyone, um, and that means that everyone that's completed Act 6 has got that achievement. And that's about 17% of the player base. Then, 7.2% of the player base have the achievement for killing Izaro in the Eternal Labyrinth. So that should give you a sense that something like 45% of the players that decide they stick with the game long enough to kill Tukahama in Act 6, 45% of them uh, proceed to kill Izaro in the Eternal Labyrinth. We're not talking Merciless Lab, we're talking Eternal Lab there. So killing the Izaro in the Eternal Labyrinth is no small achievement, no matter how much uh, people that have, you know, people like me that have done it plenty of times can do it on autopilot. Uh, it requires, you know, navigating a complex maze, uh, dealing with a whole lot of traps, uh, and also killing a boss three times in a row without dying once. Uh, so yeah, basically, the fact, that, uh, the fact is, casual players are better than a lot of people give them credit for. Many of these are players that, if you were to give them uh, a set of gear that uh, is like what a typical enfranchised player might have at the end of a league, and put them up against the Shaper, they'll probably beat him with three or four attempts. When I say attempts, I don't mean a, lo a death and a single loss of portal, I mean complete instance failures. Uh, they'll get him down, and they'll be able to push on, and you know, then possibly even do bigger and better things later. 
Now, I was one of these types of players uh, up to about the Parandus League. Second group is the Enfranchised players. I was originally going to call this, uh, this group the Casual Endgamers, uh, but then I felt that would cause people to underestimate their skill. These are the players that reach Path of Exile's endgame, run hundreds of maps per league, but don't beat the toughest bosses. They don't run thousands of maps. They don't hit level 100. Uh, there's lots of things that they don't achieve. They don't ever acquire a Mirror of Calandra uh, or a Headhunter, but pretty much anything under that level uh, is within their power to get. So these people, uh, plenty of them will run around in a six-link Chevron's wrappings or even a six-link Farrell's fur if they're really, you know, if which can be quite a bit more expensive if it's in, in on demand, that league. But they won't have a two implicit corrupted one that's awesome. They'll just have the basic item. I would say that these players are defined by generally being able to beat the Shaper, but not beat him with terrible gear right at the start of the league. So it might take them a couple of weeks to, to secure the gear that they need, uh, and then they're able to take on Shaper. Likewise, they can probably beat Cirrus or Uber Elder with a bit of practice, a fair bit of practice, uh, and but not necessarily deathless and not necessarily until right near the end of the league when, they're, when everything has come together for them. I was in this category of player from Parandus League up to Harbinger League. Uh, so Harbinger League was the first time that I killed the Guardians of the Shaper. So I killed the Minotaur, the Chimera, the Phoenix, and the Hydra. That league, I don't think I got any of them deathless on my first try, but eventually I got through all of them. Some of these enfranchised players aspire to becoming power gamers, and many of them do. Essentially, anyone that aspires to long enough will. The third category is the power gamers. Uh, usually the most knowledgeable players and the most skilled players. Uh, this relatively small section of the player base includes almost all of the streamers, and really I would say they're defined by an attitude. If I fail content, I'll do whatever is needed to improve so that I can beat it. These players tend to know a lot about the game, including all sorts of niche, weird and wonderful interactions. Uh, you know, they're, they're the only people that understand conversion fully. And whilst they don't know everything, they have a good sense of what important parts of the game they don't know much about and are capable of researching those gaps if and when it becomes important to do so. So for instance, a power gamer that didn't know about crafting tags uh, would know that PoEDB existed and would simply go there and research all the information that they needed. These players can execute difficult strategies when fighting tough encounters uh, and will get 36 or 40 challenges in any league that they try to. This is the only section of the player base that can afford to acquire items like Mirrors of Calandra, Headhunter, One Burn Socket Voices, uh, Badge of the Brotherhood and the like, although not every power gamer will acquire all of these things in a given league. Essentially, this section of the player base will see uh, spending 20, 50, even 200 exalts on an item, or even a thousand, as simply being a means to an end. One last definition I want to make is a loot quality scale. I'm going to use an out of 10 scale, but this is going to be much harder than most people's uh, ideas of a scale. The 10 is going to be a soft limit, so things can go beyond it. And essentially, I'm setting 10 out of 10 as being items that would have been meritier in the Metamorph League. So 11 or higher means items that you couldn't have crafted on a budget of 10 mirrors in Metamorph. 7 of 10 is items that would be good enough for an enfranchised player to beat Uber Elder if they've read up on the fight, uh, and likely good enough items to do so deathless with a bit of practice. So a build with all 7 of 10 items can probably do about 2 million damage per second against Uber Elder, uh, even after factoring in all of the do uh, downtime, damage downtime from dodging attacks and the like, uh, and it has enough defensive layers to leave them some room for errors. So this doesn't mean that you're going to be able to just face tank every nasty attack in the game, but you'll be able to make a few mistakes and still get Uber Elder done with your six portals. Four of 10 is items that are good enough for a power gamer to beat Uber Elder at league start. Uh, now, power gamers do not need anywhere near the quality of items that, a, that an enfranchised player does because they simply know the fight much better uh, and you know, have more practice executing it. Uh, so I would say something like 500,000 damage per second and not enough defenses to allow room for errors with Shaper Balls or Icicles. 
Uh, and if you want to see a really extreme version of this, uh, there was a video that was done a while ago by Tai Tai Killer, who's one of the best players in the entire game. And he took on Uber Elder, I think, on, on a character that was level 37. Uh, and, you know, like had absolutely min max gear for that, for that level in every slot, including a, a ring that was corrupted to grant level 21 wrath and things like that. Uh, but he was able to defeat Uber Elder, taking no hits and only minimal damage from the degens, uh, just by simply out executing executing everything in the fight flawlessly. Uh, that was an incredible thing to watch, and I wish I had a link to it to provide you. But uh, 4 of 10 is is not the gear that Tai Tai Killer needs. It's a gear that a normal power gamer needs uh, to, in order to beat Uber Elder. And then one, of 10 gear is, one out of 10 gear is just life resist gear of middling quality. That's sort of enough for you to get started running yellow maps. So if you've got this gear in every slot, then you're not going to have much damage, but you're going to have capped resistances. You're going to have the sort of three and a half to 4,000 life that you need in order to comfortably start running yellow maps. Uh, but you're going to feel your damage is really anemic when it comes to doing red maps. Now, it's also uh, my broad, like my, this scale was broadly based around the idea that each tier of items is about five times as expensive as the previous tiers, uh, and, or at least it was prior to harvest crafting. And four of ten items were about 10 chaos, five of ten about 50 chaos. Uh, the 6 of 10, about an exalt and a half. 7 of 10, around 8 exalts. Uh, 9 of 10, around 40 exalts. Sorry, no, 8 of 10 is 40 exalts. Uh, 9 of 10 is 200x. 10 of 10, i.e. mirror tier, is about 1,000 exalts. And then 11 and 12 are beyond that. These are things that were just not possible to craft uh, in previous leagues at all. So... I want to go through these categories of people, their opinions on harvest crafting, and present these as fairly as I can, even though I don't agree with some of them. So firstly, there's the casual player that's not interested in crafting or has never dabbled really with it. These are probably the people with the most negative reaction to the league. Uh, I think these, these player types logged into the new league week one, saw that it was all about crafting, and just thought, yep, no, nah, this isn't for me. All that crafting stuff, that's overwhelming. That's too complex. Uh, let's leave that for the power gamers and then yeah they've already quit the league uh, these people likely don't care whether whether harvest goes core or not but if it does they probably won't engage with it they just thought the league itself was a disappointment the second category is the casual player that dabbles in crafting and i would say that these are probably the people with the second most positive reaction to the league so these players have seen a tremendous surge in character power this league uh, even though they aren't crafting gear that's customised to their character's strengths and weaknesses, uh, it's easy to find guides on the internet, uh, such as on YouTube, uh, with information on how to craft some pretty incredible general purpose items. Uh, and additionally, plenty of people who are trying to craft those monumentally powerful 8 of 10, 9 of 10, 10 of 10 items, uh, plenty of their crafts fail. And when they fail a craft, uh, they generally will try to sell the item and recover as much as possible of the currency that they invested into it. And so these casual players have gained both by being able to purchase those uh, failed crafts from other players sometimes, but also being able to craft things themselves. And I think that the game, and this is an opinion here, but I think that the game going forward should try to capture what this section of the player base loves about harvest crafting. And that is easy access to five of 10 items. Uh, items that are good enough for beating second tier bosses like Elder and Shaper, but that don't provide enough power to trivialize harder encounters like Uber Elder or the new monster level 83 Azaro encounters. Now many of these players have 7 of 10 or better items in most slots this league due to harvest crafting, when in previous leagues they might have capped out around 3 out of 10 in most slots and you know 4 or 5 in occasional slots. Something like a set of Hunter Influence boots that's been hit by 6 to 8 Reforge with a crit mod crafts, uh, then a couple of just accessible augments, will likely result in the, uh, at least one set of boots that has Tailwind, 25% or better move speed, a good life roll, and at least one good resist. An item that would have been 10 to 20 exalts last league, uh, and that's better than any set of meta mirror tier boots that existed in any league prior to the Metamorph League. 
So basically, these these players, this section of the player base, love harvest. And any changes that I propose, I want to try and make sure that they are still pretty happy with them. I'll come to that later. Okay, so the third group is the enfranchised player that isn't interested in crafting. So like the casual non-crafters, these I think were the people who mostly complained a lot during week one of the league uh, and then quit. However, some of them had enough of a power gamer, learn whatever I need to learn to win attitude that they decided to learn crafting. And many of these have then ended up having really positive reactions to the league. Uh, and are probably the uh, and you know they're probably the most enthusiastic supporters of the harvest mechanics. Uh, next up, we have the enfranchised player who does a lot of crafting, which obviously includes uh, the the section of the enfranchised player that wasn't interested in crafting before, but became interested through the harvest league. So these players have loved this league as well. Uh, Ultra power crafting has allowed them to progress further through endgame content than ever before. So players that previously killed Shaper and Elder but nothing past that are now insta-phasing Uber Elder while wearing powerful gear that allows them to face tank Elder's Annulus Blast or Shaper's Slam or Elder's Slam or other mechanics that previously were instant death. Some of the best players in this category have gone beyond Uber Elder and, and Awakening Level 8 Cyrus and are now uh, killing bosses like All in the Delve Mines or High Templar Venarius in the Cortex. Uh, two of the bosses that were previously absolutely restricted to power gamers and not just to power gamers but to power gamers that had really specialized in getting those bosses down or alternately some of them are now clearing 100% delirious maps where you know previously they would have struggled with 20% so harvest has provided these players the encouragement needed for them to leap right into the power gamer territory among this group there seem to be two main attitudes to harvest uh, two attitudes that are both positive but that are actually entirely counterposed to each other. So the first attitude is people that think, this is fantastic because I can craft my own gear. And the second attitude is, this harvest crafting is great, but I hate all the trading involved with it. Ultimately, both are correct. Harvest allows crafting six out of 10 items with no trading. Uh, all you do is you just use the seeds that you've looted yourself, you grow them, uh, and then you focus on the specific crafts that you really want and you use them strategically, no trading involved, you can create yourself a ridiculously good item that is far better than, than this tier of players probably ever owned in previous leagues. However, crafting 9 of 10, 10 of 10, 11 of 10, 12 of 10 items, uh, this requires extensive trading of services, which is, in my opinion, the most miserable experience in Path of Exile today. And to give a quick example of this, uh, I, the only 9 of 10 item I've created this league was a Cluster Jewel Life and Chaos Resistance one, and I had to purchase 30 Add and Remove Chaos Crafts for it. Uh, this was just a miserable experience of, you know, spending countless, uh, spending a ridiculous amount of time in Discord, uh, negotiating with people, and hoping that those people had the integrity that the system seemed to indicate that they did. Now I wasn't scammed, uh, and you know, like I ended up getting my jewel eventually, but it was just a horrible, horrible, horrible experience. The fifth group uh, is the power gamer, and their reactions have been quite different to each other. So the first group focuses on crafting the, t the 11 out of 10 and 12 out of 10 items, and trades for bulk delirium orbs and fractured fossils, using those powerful consumables to create content that is still engaging to run with these absolutely bonkers items. For them, ultimately, it's this, uh, this cycle where the more, the, more, uh, the more crafting that you do, the more ridiculous content you can run. The more ridiculous content you can run, the more crafting you can afford to do. So things like 100% uh, Delirious Tier 19 maps with, with Sextants and Scarabs, are still engaging up to about uh, you know, 8 or 10 gear level with top, the very top meta builds like Intelligence Stacking Wonders uh, or Spectre, uh, the incredible Spectre builds of this league or even to 10 or 10, level, 10 or 10 gear level with less optimized builds. So these players' opinions of Harvest really come down to how they feel about doing the level of trading necessary to s sustain this content. So... Ultimately, these people either love the league or they've decided, you know what, I'm really getting sick of trading in the game. 
And that, that I think, is the first major class of reaction in Power Gamers. It's to simply accept that Harvest has made us more powerful, we're now doing more powerful, con uh, more difficult content, and to do whatever is necessary to get access to that content. A second reaction from Power Gamers has been people who focused on building one character that's absurdly powerful, more powerful than anything they've played in previous leagues, then they've quit the league because they felt like they've beaten it. Uh, these people reach that point more quickly than ever before. And just a couple of days ago, uh, I had someone that had got their 40 challenges done uh, message me on Reddit saying, hey, I'm quitting the league, do all my stuff. Uh, and you know, I think that this is earlier than that player would have quit in a normal league. And the reason for that is just that they're so much more powerful than normal. Uh, a third group start out like the second group, but they keep playing. And they keep restarting with cilia and cilia builds, uh, weaker and weaker builds, and letting the overpowered harvest crafted gear carry them. So many streamers will do this, and they'll have lots of fun doing it. Uh, so this is the sort of person that might uh, start out playing as an intelligent stacking wander. Uh, then once they realize, oh, everything's trivial at the moment because intelligent stacking wanders are OP, uh, they then go, all right, well, I'm now going to see. I've always liked Voidforge. Can I make Voidforge work in this league? And then they just take, uh, they craft ridiculously focused items, uh, spending hundreds of exalts on making a Voidforge character that's ridiculously good. And then once they've done that, they're like, well, I was able to do that with Voidforge. I wonder if I can do the same thing with Frostbomb. Can I make a Frostbomb build? And then once they've done that, it's like, well, I managed to make Frostbomb work. Uh, can I make uh, can I make flame dash totems work? Uh, and so, you know, like they're continually uh, leveraging the incredible power that they've got from their gear uh, to make more and more silly builds work over time. And then fourthly, there's another group that uh, quit the league very quickly, uh, long before pot potentially even killing Uber Elder, uh, after thinking that there's just no content worth seeing in this league at all, uh, this is just like playing the core game, but even easier. I've seen several comments on my channel from people in this category. So these people do exist. Uh, they're a part of the player base that have just really been disinterested in this league. And the reason for it is that they're all have thought about the harvest mechanics is, oh yeah, this is just, this is just standard except even easier. So what are my own thoughts? Uh, well, my thoughts are generally negative. I'm usually in the power gamer ca category. But in this league, my real-life job of working aircraft technical records uh, has been extremely busy and my internet has been unreliable. Both of these actually are due to the stupid coronavirus. I uh, really hate this thing. Uh, more people working from home, including myself in Australia, means that there's just more strain on the internet. Uh, the internet infrastructure isn't up to the job. And additionally, I've just been super busy because av commercial aviation leasing is in a in a crisis period at the moment and that makes everything more busy so i've stepped back this league anyway to the enfranchised player level now i would have done that anyway uh whether the harvest league was you know was something i liked as much as i like synthesis or delve or whether it was something that i didn't like or whether it was something in between like blight uh, so i've dropped back to the enfranchised player level but obviously i still have all the knowledge that i had before so first and foremost I personally have more fun playing a game when I'm failing content, or at least coming very close to it, than I have when it's on farm and success seems guaranteed. This is why I've never progressed beyond character level 95. Uh, it's not for lack of playtime, it's because I start thinking, well, you know what I need to do at the moment? I'm going to take a 100% delirious map and just give it a go. Or I'll, say, or I'll say to myself, hey, I've got this depth 525 Kurgle. I don't really know the Kurgle fight very well, so why don't I go and try and learn it? Uh, and either way, uh, boom, six deaths later, uh, I've realized that I actually do not. I am not yet up to the point of doing that content. I sort of know that all along, but hey, I'll, I'll give it a go because having a go is fun. Failing is fun. Uh, at least that's my opinion. Now, Harvest makes crafting six, six out of 10 and seven out of 10 items genuinely trivial to players that have a working knowledge of the game's crafting mechanics. Of course, learning this is a big endeavor, but we're talking, uh, you know, talking for me, I do have this knowledge. 
9 of 10 and better does require a lot of trading or luck still, and I just absolutely loathe service trading. So as a result, I haven't really enjoyed interacting with the harvest crafting, which is interesting because in Synthesis, I had a lot of fun uh, playing around with the crafting bear, where I'd be like, okay, I, you know, I've sort of carved out a niche uh, for myself crafting uh, helmets, hubris circlets with plus flat energy shield as an implicit, which were hugely popular in that league, and then craft them and then enchant them and then try and sell them. And the way that I was doing that involved a lot of trading, but the trading was straightforward transactions. Uh, so, you know, it would be find a hubris circlet that has the locked mods that I want, uh, and then the, the seller is asking 60 chaos, and then I just simply say, all right, hey, I want to buy this hubris off you, you're charging 60 chaos, and we just meet, we transact, and it's done. Whereas the service trading that is all over the Harvest League uh, is a nightmare. You know, you have to find someone's ad on the Forgotten Trove Discord, uh, then you see half of the people there advertise what crafts they've got but don't advertise the prices, so I ignore all of them and keep going down until I find someone that's advertising it with a price. Uh, and then we've, they've got them, they've got three of the craft I want, we agree on a price, you know, maybe they want 30 chaos for their remove ad chaos and I'm fine with that. Uh, so I take 90 chaos and then I go and do the trade with them. I hope they're not a scammer. I haven't actually been scammed this league, but it, it, I am exposed to it regularly. Uh, and then ultimately I have to remember to alt tab out of the game again, give them a vouch for the service. Uh, and it's just a nightmare. It's just an absolute mess. So that's something that has really soured me against the against the crafting in this league despite the fact that i absolutely loved the crafting in synthesis uh, but the main issue that i have with harvest is that there's no accessible content that remains engaging once you hit six out of ten and better gear so tier 14 to 16 maps are everywhere we have you know we're building up enormous stockpiles of them uh, in our uh, in our map tabs but they're too they're tuned to be engaging to people in sort of t three to four out of 10 gear, and content harder than tier 16 is too rare to sustain. Uh, but there's also two other minor issues I want to discuss. This is a lack of wow moments and the near removal of diminishing returns. So firstly, wow moments. Uh, I think the easiest way to explain this is to give some examples. Uh, in Incursion League, I had the best ID scroll craft I've ever had in Path of Exile, a uh, physical damage one-handed mace that had 400 and something DPS. Now this wouldn't actually be particularly amazing now, but at the time it was incredible. Uh, it had a high tier physical damage percent uh, mod, it had top tier increased attack speed, it had a fairly high tier increased flat damage, and a fairly high tier mod in the Dictators pool as well. So it wasn't Merciless Dictators and Flaring, but I think it was like tier 3 in each of those categories, plus Celebration for tier 1 attack speed really really good item back then and you know like initially I, I saw it and I listed it for 7x it didn't sell so I dropped it to 5 and then someone offered me 4.5 and, and I was like yep you know what I'll do that uh, that was the deal that I got there that was a really exciting moment now of course with recent power creep and this actually predates harvest but harvest has sealed it uh, I've just stopped identifying rare items in later leagues I hit a few occasional incredibly lucky crafts so you know I'd be crafting um Elder Helmets with uh, with Enchanted Fossils and hit the plus three Molten Strike Projectiles Enchant on it before it was nerfed. Uh, that was a huge, huge wow moment where it's so much better than I was expecting as a result. Uh, and likewise in Synthesis, I had a Val Regalia where I hit a, lucky, uh, hit a lucky implicit of gain an Endurance Charge each second if you've been hit recently. Many a miss too, but the big hits more than made up for it. In Harvest, though, there's basically none of these moments. Uh, it's just, I've calculated I'm 1 in 15 to get this craft. The closest you get to a wow moment is getting it on your third try. Uh, and that just doesn't feel as exciting as getting something completely unexpected and far better than your expectations when you're carrying out some other craft. So I feel that these wow moments are gone. Now, for some people, that's positive because it means it flattens out the crafting experience. Uh, for me, it's been a negative. Ultimately, that's just, that's just a matter of opinion. The next point I want to make is diminishing returns uh, in crafting. So, uh, prior to Harvest, there were considerable diminishing returns on investment in equipment. Uh, generally speaking, to, on my scale that I defined earlier, uh, it, it, look, it's a rough rule of thumb, but each 
each step that you want to go up in that scale costs about five times as much. Likewise, you have the same experience, uh, the same sort of diminishing returns experience where putting in more effort does provide more returns but at a much lower rate when you look at other character power systems. Uh, casual players can quite readily get their hands on the first six Labyrinth Ascendancy points, but the last two are going to be something that takes them a bit longer, uh, quite a lot more effort. Hitting level 85 grants almost all the power that you get for hitting level 95, but takes about a tenth of the time. Hitting 95, uh, sorry, going from 95 to 100, again, getting 100 will take 10 times as long as getting 95, but it's only granting a tiny bit more power. Essentially, you've got this diminishing return system which keeps the, which minimizes the effect of extreme grinding. Uh, it means that ultimately there's a ceiling to how much power you can get through grinding alone, and ultimately you're going to need either skill or knowledge to break through that ceiling. Now I think that this uh, diminishing returns are a very good mechanic in the game. Reduces the power gap between players. Doubling what you spend on a character should not double or more your income per hour played. Uh, that's how you wind up with a standard-like economy where the rich few have an insurmountable lead over everyone else. Harvest does not have diminishing returns built in. Uh, using the Harvest remove a speed mod and add a new speed mod, uh, adds roughly the same potential whether it's wasted on a set of 1 out of 10 item level 70 boots or whether it's used to its maximum potential on a set of, of level 86 set of hunter boots that have got an abyss socket, 55 intelligence, tier 1 flat energy shield, tier 1 percentage energy shield, a crafted suffix uh, which is there for blocking reasons, and 10% move speed. Uh, that's how you would go about crafting uh, absolute mirror tier tailwind, tailwind energy shield boots. Diminishing returns mechanics are also, uh, they're a gap closer. Harvest doesn't have them. Normal crafting does. Getting two ideal mods is much easier than getting three. Getting three is much easier than getting four. And getting four is much easier than getting five. Getting six is nearly impossible. The few six perfect mod items that exist in a, in a pre-harvest league usually had literally thousands of exalts thrown at them in the form of meta mod crafting. And even then, you know, throwing thousands of exalts at them wasn't guaranteed to get you them. In Harvest though, going from a 3 perfect mod item to 4 perfect mods requires exactly the same as going from 5 perfect mods to 6 perfect mods. So basically going from an item that might have been 3 out of 10 to an item that might be 5 out of 10 is roughly the same as going from an item that's 7 out of 10 to 9 out of 10. Uh, so all the good things about diminishing returns are pretty much gone in this league. Incidentally, this also means that casual and enfranchised players would pretty much always benefit if they sell their premium crafts to power gamers. Uh, power gamers can simply use them better, and even after the power gamer takes a cut, uh, i.e. gives them a bit less than might be fair for the, for the service, uh, the casual player will get more value out of their premium craft this way. The same reason, really, that casual players shouldn't be exalt slamming items. Uh, the opportunity cost of using up that exalted orb exceeds the benefit that they will gain from it uh, when you consider that they could instead have traded that exalted orb to a power gamer who can simply do more with it. So back to the point of power creep, content accessibility and map sustain. I want to take a quick flashback to the era of the game where Legacy League, Harbinger League, Abyss, Bestiary and Incursion. So that series of five leagues, uh, it's now a couple of years ago, I think it's about three years ago now. This was the period where I transitioned from being an enfranchised player to a power gamer. Uh, and during this period of the game, tier 14, 15 and 16 maps were pretty close to power gamer only. They were somewhat rare, and when people talked about sustaining tier 15 maps, what they actually meant was they start with 100 tier 15 maps, they run them all, get 45 tier 16s and 60 tier 14s that they sell, get 80 tier 15s, which is most of their next map pool, and then they either run some 14s and 16s and get excess tier 15s that way, or they buy tier 15s from another player. Overall, like you, you were still swimming in loop during this period if you were selling off your excess maps, uh, but you wouldn't be running solely one tier, uh, you'd be jumping between them all. Now, an enfranchised player was capable of beating a tier 15 map here or there at this point, but they probably suffer some deaths and close calls, 
uh, especially given that the tier 15 maps at that time had generally had the hardest bosses in the game, 15 and 16. Uh, and they would generally experience much better outcomes by dropping a few tiers, running tier 9 to 13 maps, selling their high tier map drops to power gamers, uh, and maybe running a couple here and there to get shape absorbs when necessary. Uh, shape absorbs are just a, a legacy thing reasonably similar to today's watchstones that permanently modified your atlas. Casual players that made it past Act 10 back in this time mostly spent their time running yellow maps. And so the key to this era was that power gamers could sustain the content aimed at them, tier 14 to 16 maps, and even when a power gamer ran out of the content designed for them, it wasn't some huge leap down uh, into something that was miles too easy to be engaging. They weren't forced into content they found trivial, just down to tier 11 to 13 maps for a while, which were reasonably similar to the tier 14 plus maps that they'd rather run. Contrast to today, I consider the hardest content that a player is likely to beat with a good chance of doing so deathless, assuming that they have made use of harvest power creep. So for the casual player in the Abyss era, uh, that was pretty much yellow maps and maybe tier fives as well. Uh, I would argue that a casual player now that is exploiting harvest, uh, harvest mechanics can now elk and go tier 16 maps just fine uh, and run them deathless mostly. An enfranchised player, uh, in Abyss Era was running tier 11 to 13 maps, so the lower half of red maps. This is exactly where I was during the Harbinger and Legacy Leagues. Uh, and then in the leagues after that, so the Abyss, uh, Bestiary and Incursion, uh, I then jumped up into the Power Gamer territory. Uh, and I would say the equivalent of tier 11 to 13 maps in that era now is tier 14 to 16 maps that have got something making them a bit harder. So this could be Delirium Orb, a single Delirium Orb that is, uh, or three plus one level watchstones, or maybe some of the harder scarabs. Or alternately, uh, you know, tier 14 to 16 map where you get the delirium mirror in the map. And then we have the power gamers. Uh, in Abyss era, tier 14 to 16 maps was, was for them. Uh, in Harvest, for a power gamer that actually exploits harvest crafting to the max, uh, it's basically immensely augmented tier 14 to 16 maps. So, you know, You've got all of the Cirrus Watchstones, so they're actually tier 17, 18, and 19. Uh, you're using high-end Scarabs, not just using any old Scarab, you're using the top ones, uh, and you're using two or more Delirium Orbs per map. Now, power, power Creep, mostly in the Harvest League, but also beforehand, has rendered our characters too powerful for the old end game of tier 14 to 16 maps. Uh, obviously, with the exception of casual players who are now now are the people who those maps are mostly focused on. Content beyond this does exist thanks to Delirium, but it doesn't solve the issue. The fundamental issue here is that the content beyond tier 14 to 16 maps is gated behind extensive trading. Trading for watchstones, or for ivory watchstones that is. Uh, trading for Delirium orbs. Trading for scarabs. This is finicky and annoying and just drives me nuts. Now, as a power gamer in Incursion League, I could sustain engaging content with minimal trading. Uh, in the Harvest Era, I've just got to heavily trade for Delirium Orbs, Watchstones, Gilded Scarabs, Fractured Fossils as an alternative method to essentially duplicate uh, Delirium Orbs. So Harvest Power Creep has removed the ability for power gamers and for the stronger of the enfranchised players to sustain engaging content. Trading, and ultimately enriching people who run bot cheat software to, pr to profit from trade arbitrage, is now more essential to end game than it ever has been before. And the game systems don't address this. So the next point that I wanna make about Harvest is that I feel that it has massively expanded the gap in character power between people who do understand crafting and people who do not. Uh, furthermore, by setting extreme new maximums for character power level, uh, it's widened the gap in power between those who trade and those who do not. Uh, so character power growth is more heavily tied to crafting knowledge than ever before. A player that understands weightings, mod tags, eye level requirements, and mod blocking is, going, is not going to have items that are just one or two points higher on the 10 point scale uh, than they would have had without the knowledge. They'll be using 9 of 10 to 11 out of 10 items, while other comparable players are running 4 to 7 out of 10 items. Diminishing returns in crafting close that gap, Harvest removed the diminishing returns, and therefore blew it wide open again. So my final thoughts. I think there's one very positive aspect to harvest crafting. Easy, somewhat close to deterministic access to four and five out of 10 items via methods that casual players can understand. 
I think that anything going forward should retain this. However, I think the overall effect of the mechanic is a net negative, as it pushes the top 25% or so of endgame players, so all the power gamers and many of the enfranchised players, into a situation where they can't sustain engaging content. I've got five possible, five possible solutions to this. I want to go through them all. Uh, the first one, which is advocated by many on Reddit, is to integrate Harvest Crafting in full and tell those players that lose access to engaging content as a result that put up with this new endgame, you don't matter, casual players are the majority, you don't deserve content, developers should only devote time to them, not to you, no life a scum. Uh, and yes, I have been called a no life a scum on Reddit by some of these people. I term the people that make this argument toxic casuals. Uh, and I think the choice of words should clarify where I stand on this. Uh, essentially, these are people who think that anyone better than them at the game is, or think that anyone that knows more about them in the game, uh, on the game uh, is some sort of scumbag no-lifer who doesn't deserve to have any fun. Uh, these people should be driven from the game. And yeah, I think that dismissing the concerns of people who play dif differently to you is toxic behaviour. Deserves nothing but contempt. And ultimately, I think the game would be better if the people with that toxic mindset were completely ridiculed on Reddit, uh, were driven out of... Well, actually, yeah, even go as far as to say driven out of the game. Uh, but let's actually take this let's take this um take this and break it down anyway and imagine what would happen if this were attempted uh and just to try and put a dispassionate attitude that doesn't take into account my opinions so harvest crafting goes core close to as is with no meaningful nerfs to it and no increased access to above tier 16 content i think we would see a growing number of power gamers and enfranchised players quit the game uh they would cite the hassle of trading and possibly, and, in, and say, you know, I can't sustain delirium orbs, and I get bored when I'm not running them. Ultimately, the problem would be that their characters are too powerful for the content available to them. Now, with those players gone, uh, particularly the power gamers, so many of the build designers, uh, the third-party developers like Path of Building and Excellence and PoEDB, and most of the other community resources like that. Now, many of the people that are involved in this part of the game community started as casual players, but just by virtue of sticking with the game and learning all the ins and outs of it, became power gamers over time. Uh, and there's certainly not enough money in what they do for, uh, for it to be any reason other than a passion project. So once the passion's gone, these people are gone. Uh, once they're gone, of course, all of the resources stop working and the game gets worse for everyone. So even if you are a casual player uh, who has no aspirations of being, any, of being in any other category, I think that this is a bad outcome for you, uh, as well as you know, leaving aside how obnoxious I feel that, that attitude is. Uh, but that's just the first option. Let's look through the others. The second option is to keep harvest crafting mostly intact, but to increase access to post tier 16 content. Uh, and perhaps you could do this by adding delirium mobs to the pool of mapping related currencies that the awakening level causes to drop from map bosses. Uh, perhaps you could do this by adding delirium orbs to other locations in game. And actually uh, a part of this is behind the divination card that I commissioned, uh, that I'm well in the process, early stages of commissioning uh, the price of prescience, which will be for a 100% delirious corrupt rare Val temple map. You know, this is just basically a source of ridiculously difficult content, something that you can just try and try and fail and fail at. Uh, now, what do I think will happen if we do this? I think it's the second best of the solutions I'm going to propose, uh, but it still leaves players needing to go through the hassle of service, cra uh, service trading in order to craft items. And yeah, like I generally find this really unpleasant part of Path of Exile. Uh, so essentially you have a situation where the first week or so of the league, uh, you're getting your hands on 4 of 10, 5 of 10, 6 of 10 items. You do that yourself. And then after that, you push towards making 7, 8, 9, 10 of 10 items and doing that by using, uh, by using various harvest crafting and service trading uh, to get yourself something absolutely ridiculous. Uh, and then this allows you to beat all of the beyond tier 16 content that has then been added to the game through more access to delirium mobs. I also think a second issue that would come up with this is that more delirium mobs means more loot flooding the economy. 
this loot would be concentrated in the hands of power gamers, uh, and that will distort the economy in ways that hurts the more casual players as well. So not, ge not ge you know, basically wealth concentration, generally speaking, hurts the people who don't get that extra wealth, and this would concentrate wealth in the hands of the top 5% of players. So I think that I've got some concerns about this, but I think it's an all right option. Uh, the third option is to keep Harvest Crafting mostly intact, but to raise the difficulty of high tier maps so that enfranchised players and power gamers both have more to do short of highly delirious maps. Uh, now, in practice, this would mean massive increases to monster power in those tiers of maps. And I think that this would involve increasing the hit points of mon uh, by factors of 5 to 20 uh, and action speed by 10% to account for all the power creep players have got. Ultimately, uh, I don't like this because it's going to end up hurting casual players. Uh, so why I think the hit points would need to be increased by as large a factor as 5 to 20, why it's not just a case of 20% increase, uh, is because ha what Harvest Crafting lets you do, by turning all of your resists into 46 to 48 resist, uh, all of the resist affixes that you have on items into 46 to 48% resists, which is relatively easily done, by using remove and add crafts. Uh, once you've done this, you then don't need resist in as many affixes, and you can then deterministically craft on additional mods that make your character much more capable of dealing damage. So it winds up that you get a tremendous amount of increased damage by virtue of condensing your resist into smaller numbers of slots. And that's why players are actually dealing not just, you know, whilst if their weapon is one tier higher on that uh, out of 10 scale that I outlined before, the weapon itself might only be getting an extra 10% or 15% more damage than what they'd had in a previous league. But uh, that is also coming at the same time as their rings are going from having two damage and four defensive mods to having four damage and two defensive mods. Their amulet goes from having uh, life and two resists and, one off oh, and two offensive mods to being just life and five offensive mods. A huge increase in power in every slot, which means that you just do so much more damage. But anyway, uh, my opinion on this, I think this would be a really bad change for the game uh, because it would make casual players feel like there's an overwhelming barrier to their progress in the league. And I'm not willing to advocate something that would hurt casual players that much. Uh, the fourth option would be to make nothing about Harvest go core at all. Uh, this would solve all of the problems that Harvest Power Creep crea creates at the top end of the power base, but in my opinion comes at an unacceptable cost of weakening the level of character power that casual players can achieve, compared to what they've had a taste of in Harvest. Uh, now, whilst I would personally find this more fun than the first two options, I'm not willing to advocate taking that much away from casual players. So fifth and finally is what I'm going to advocate. Surgical and severe nerfs to Harvest Crafts. Uh, that make them remain excellent at getting established in a league, i.e. creating your 4 of 10 and 5 of 10 items, but that cuts out the ability to mass produce 8 to 12 out of 10 items. And the specific change I have in mind is to nerf the top end harvest crafts. So this is the augments, the surgical annuls, the remove add crafts, by making them completely unable to be applied to influenced items. What this would do is leave a casual player able to make their life resist items to establish themselves in endgame and to get comfortably farming uh, middle yellow tier, maybe even low red tier maps. Or they could use reforge crafts to force one powerful mod such as Tailwind on boots, but they would not allow enfranchised players or power gamers to, to break the system as far as we can now. With that change made, I think that Harvest would be a good addition to the core game. It would become the, best, the unquestioned best way to craft jewels, uh, it'd become the un question best way to craft caster weapons for most niches uh, and also to get a set of gear together to start mapping and it would be an important step en route to awaken or crafts but other types of crafting would have a place in the game again because right now i feel like even the classic orb crafts like ex exalted orbs uh, their actual crafting uh, their actual use as crafting implements is extremely extremely undercut by the existence of the, uh, of the harvest mechanic. Uh, additionally, as well as making it so that other types of crafting, like classic orbs and fossils, would have a spot in the game again, uh, this would also create a situation where the wow moments of hitting something uh, much better than you'd hoped for would be back. 
So anyway, uh, as I did warn you, this would be a long one. Uh, it's a very long one, but I'm going to leave it there. Definitely interested in your comments, your thoughts and the like. Uh, but otherwise, I hope you have a good one, and I hope you're enjoying Harvest more than I have.